Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Joan and Henry Katz Lecture in Judaic Studies, an annual lecture sponsored by Fairfield University's Bennett Center for Judaic Studies. This lecture series is made possible through the great generosity of Debbie and David Zeef, honoring the late Joan and Henry Katz. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Ellen Umansky, the Carl and Dorothy Bennett Professor of Judaic Studies at Fairfield University and founding director of the university's Bennett Center for Judaic Studies, the oldest Judaic Studies Center at any of the 27 Jesuit colleges and universities in the United States. I am delighted to introduce this evening our speaker, Dr. Kirsten Formaglish, Professor of History and Jewish Studies at Michigan State University. She has been at MSU since 2001. Dr. Formaglish received her BA from Columbia University and her PhD in History from New York University. Her scholarly work includes American Dreams and Nazi Nightmares, Early Holocaust Consciousness and Liberal America, published in 2006 by Brandeis University Press, a book that looks at Holocaust consciousness as seen in the writings of four well-known secular Jewish intellectuals in the early 1960s. She is the co-editor of the Norton Critical Edition of Betty Friedan's The Feminist Mystique, The Feminine Mystique, which traces the cultural and historical significance of Friedan's work 50 years after its initial publication in 1963. And she is the author of A Rosenberg by Any Other Name, A History of Jewish Name Changing in America, published by NYU Press in 2018 and recipient of the American Jewish Historical Society's 2019 Saul Viner Prize for the best book in American Jewish history. Kristen Formaglish is currently co-editor with Adam Mendelson and Daniel Sawyer of the scholarly journal, American Jewish History. She has published in the Journal of American History, American Jewish History, the Michigan Historical Review, Southern Jewish History, and several edited volumes. She has won fellowships and grants from several organizations, including YIVO, the Posen Foundation, and the Association for Jewish Studies. In 2011, Kirsten received a Legacy Heritage Grant from the Association for Jewish Studies, which supported a year of programming at MSU in 2011-2012 on the theme, Telling Family Stories, Jews, Genealogy, and History. She also co-curated with Ken Walzer a 2002-2003 MSU museum exhibit entitled Uneasy Years, Michigan Jewry During Depression and War that was recognized by the Michigan Council for the Humanities as among the top 30 projects that the council had supported in 30 years. Dr. Formaglish's talk tonight will focus on some of the major theses of her recent book, A Rosenberg by Any Other Name. And she will give many examples of Jewish name changing that will bring her theses to life. Who knew that New York City civil court petitions could prove to be so enlightening? My deep thanks to Jennifer Hainos, program manager of the Venice Center for Judaic Studies, and Anthony Santora from Fairfield University's Media Center for all of the hard work that they put in to making tonight's webinar a reality. And my thanks again to David and Debbie Zeef for their great support, as well as to Kirsten for Maglish for being with us this evening. Tonight's lecture will be followed by a Q&A session. Should you have any questions that you'd like to ask Dr. Formaglish, please put them in the Q&A box, not the chat box, but the Q&A box anytime during or after the lecture. And Dr. Formaglish will get to as many of them as possible uh, after her talk. And now, although I'm, I'm sad that she and I are not getting to see one another in person this evening, uh, I'm still enormously happy and grateful that she is with us. So please join me in virtually welcoming from her home in East Lansing, Michigan, 
Dr. Kristen from English to speak on the topic, too long, too foreign, too Jewish, the rise of Jewish name changing, 1917 through 1942. Kristen. Oh, well, thank you so very much, um, Ellen. Thank you for that lovely introduction and thank you so much for inviting me to speak. I am really disappointed that I was not able to actually meet you in person and to speak in person, which I think would have been really just wonderful. Um, I'm from the East Coast and I would have really just loved to be able to be out um, uh, back in Connecticut and to see people, but um, it's really an honor and it's really exciting to be able to be here with people virtually and to have to be able to reach out to so many people. Um, uh, who are spending your evening with me. So I, it's it's really wonderful. And um, I really appreciate the, the opportunity to speak with so many people. Um, I want to, you know, absolutely thank Ellen, particularly for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I'd like to thank Jennifer Hainos and Anthony Sertoro for, for helping to make this possible. It's been wonderful. Um, I'd especially like to thank the donor um, Debbie and David Zeef, who've helped to fund the CATS lecture. Um, it, I've gotten a chance to meet them virtually, um, and it's been really just such a pleasure. So I just, I'm, I'm so thrilled that you're giving me the chance to talk about my research, um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to get started. Um, and I look forward to, please do put questions in the Q&A, um, and I'm really, really happy to talk with people um, after this. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, so, um, so the title of the talk um, is Too Long to Foreign to Jewish. Um, and this is basically sort of the first third of uh, my, my longer book of Rosenberg by any other name. Um, so I usually start if we were if we were in person um, uh, right now, which I gave a few a few talks um, uh, in person with this before we all went into our, our hiding spaces. I usually start off by asking people, um, how many people have someone in their family who's changed their name? How many people know someone who's changed their name? And, you know, I'd get people to raise their hands and, you know, by the end, everyone has their hand up. Um, uh, and, and that's kind of my way of starting by saying, you know, name changing is just an integral part of American culture and American Jewish culture. Um, anecdotes and jokes and folklore are everywhere. Um, about um, about name changing in American Jewish life and in American life. Um, and what I think is really interesting is the ways that these anecdotes and jokes and kind of stories about name changing have really shaped our understandings of name changing. Um, this was true before I started this research project. Um, and it's actually, it's kind of how I like to start off is just kind of by thinking and having us probe some of these stories that I think kind of form the way we think about name changing. So I'm going to start off with three um, popular images of name changing in American Jewish culture. There we go. Um, so the first story comes from Edward G. Robinson's memoir, All My Yesterdays. Um, an immigrant from Bucharest, Romania, Robinson changed his name from Emanuel Goldenberg um, as an 18-year-old drama student when he said, quote, in, in his memoir, it was suggested to me ever so tactfully that the name, that Emanuel Goldenberg was not a name for an actor, too long, too foreign, and I suspect too Jewish. Although he says the thought of changing it was unpleasant, somehow a denial of my beginning, somehow unfaithful to my mother and my father and my five brothers. He searched for a new amounting name and adopted his middle initial G as, quote, my prior treaty with the past. Um, and if you don't know that story, you, you probably know other, you know, movie star name change stories. That's generally the, the, the most common and the thing that, you know, everybody wanted to know if I was going to be talking about in my book the first, um, the first moment they heard what I was writing about. The second story is actually a really popular joke. Um, and again, if we were in person, um, I'll, probably half the audience would be like repeating the punchline with me as I, as I said it, because it's, it's really popular and a lot of people know it. So, um, and we'll give this kind of image to go along with it. So there's a Jewish immigrant who enters America at Ellis Island um, and he's processed according to the standard procedures, um, but they are very confusing to him. He is overwhelmed by the noise and the bustle. Um, and so one of the officials, is your name? He replied, I shan't forget. In Yiddish, I've already forgotten. And so the official then recorded his name as Sean Ferguson um, or Shane Ferguson, depending on, on, on the version you know. Um, and 
And then the third story um, is actually a scene from the popular film, Hester Street. Um, I use a lot of movies in this. I love movies. And I know a lot of my audiences, a lot of times people have seen these movies. Um, Hester Street is a dramatization of the Abraham Kahan novel, Yekyll. Um, Yekyll is an immigrant who's been in the country for several years, um, and he's tried to shed his old world life completely. He calls himself Jake. He prides himself on his Yankee clothes and his knowledge of American culture and the English language. When his father dies, he sends for his wife, played by Carol Kane here, um, and his son, but he's embarrassed of their greenhorn status, um, and he shuns his wife for a beautiful, more assimilated woman. Um, and his wife, Gittle, um, feels rejected um, and confused. And the name change is kind of a symbol of the distance between them, right? And her, her inability to understand who he is and how he's changed. Um, and, and I don't know whether you know these specific stories, but I would imagine that at least one or two of them sound familiar to you. Um, but what I want to point out for you, what I think is really interesting about them, is that even though they're really, really different stories, they all share one similarity. I'll emphasize name changing as a profoundly individual activity. In the case of Edward G. Robinson um, and all stories of movie star name changes, the name change is the act of an extraordinary individual, um, someone who is distinguished by talent or beauty or charisma, right? Immigrant Sean Ferguson's name change on the end is the result of profound isolation. His name is changed because he's a lonely individual and he has no understanding of or connections to his new culture and he has no one to aid him in navigating the system, right? And then finally, in Hester Street, name changing is identified with a young, shallow man who wants to just abandon his family and his roots and remake himself entirely in the new world, right? All three of these stories and these images suggest that name changing was an act that was entered into by individuals who were isolated or escaping from or betraying Jewish families and the Jewish community. Um, so in contrast with these three popular stories, and I'll say that when I walked into doing my research, I kind of had these stories in my head. You know, I, I didn't really know what I was going to find. Um, I was just kind of fascinated by the idea of name changes. But I think that they really are kind of powerfully shaping, um, have powerfully shaped the way we see what a name change is or the way we think about it. Um, and so in contrast with these popular images, I'd like to offer you another actually probably more common story of name changing in America. Um, in 1932, a man named Max Greenberger petitioned the city court of the city of New York to allow himself, as well as two of his four children to change their last name to Green. Um, one of Greenberger's grounds for, to, for the petition was that the name Greenberger is a foreign sounding name and is not conducive to securing good employment as a musician. Another ground, oh, excuse me. Another ground was that the name Greener is not helpful towards securing an appointment as an intern in a hospital. That was the chosen profession of one of his sons. His daughter was looking to become a musician. Greenberger's petition was one of thousands that were submitted in the middle of the 20th century to the New York City Civil Court. Men, women, and children like the Greenbergers legally changed their ethnic sounding names to less ethnically identifiable ones. Um, uh, and, and until the 1960s, Jewish names were represented disproportionately among, na among names being changed in New York City. Yet, Surprisingly, I thought when I first started doing my research, historians really have not seriously considered the significance of name changing in American or in American Jewish life. Um, scholars of American life, for the most part, have tended to take name changing for granted um, and to refer to its existence very casually, you know, a page or two, or maybe just in a sentence, note that somebody changed their names. Um, my book is actually the first in depth historical work to be written about any group changing their name in the United States. Um, I think that's a shame. I mean, it was good for me, but it's a shame because I think that by exploring the actual practice of name changing um, in more depth, we can really understand so much more about the lives of American Jews. The fact that Max Greenberger was not a young single man seeking to escape his Jewish past and succeed in an elite non-Jewish world. 
nor was he a hapless immigrant caught up by circumstances, but instead he was a middle-aged father seeking to improve his family's economic status. Um, and I think that the degree to which name changing was a voluntary group activity entered into by thousands of Jewish men, women, and children. Um, it was a strategy of class mobility that Jewish families embraced in large numbers in the middle of the 20th century. Ironically, that strategy illustrated Jews' economic um, comfort in the United States. Um, the Greenberger children were not searching for manual labor, right? Um, as much as it illustrated Jewish weakness, an identifiable Jewish name was not helpful in securing good employment. Um, ultimately, name changing was that permitted Jewish families to attain and to strengthen their position in the American middle class. But that position came at a psychological and a communal cost. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit. So in my research, I examined, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of the materials that I used um, and, and give you kind of a sense of the process that I used to, to do my research. And I'm happy to talk more about this during Q&A. Um, so um, I examined name change petitions filed in the city court of the city of New York from 1887 through 2012. So over a century of name changing. Um, and I'm happy, as I say, to talk more about um, any element of that research in more depth, um, as well as the methodology, the ways that I went through the petitions and how I how I analyzed them. Um, it is important to note that I did look at other sources. Um, I looked at Jewish organizational um, archives, um, like the National Jewish Welfare Board I, and the American Jewish Congress. Um, but the bulk of my findings um, were focused in New York City, um, in these name change petitions. Um, and that is partially because um, New York City, to be frank, offered me access to those records in a way that like Detroit, for example, was not willing to do. Um, these materials are still in the civil court. I actually went to the civil court to do this research and that's the case throughout most of the country. Name change materials are still in court and they're not set up to do the kind of normal work that historians do. So I had to get kind of special permission and special access. Um, so that's a part Part of the reason that I, I looked in New York. A lot of times when I speak to people um, in Connecticut or anywhere in the country other than New York, they want to know why I looked in New York. And so that's one reason was that I was really able to look at the materials in a way that a lot other places wouldn't necessarily allow me to. Um, but then the other reason uh, is that the research took a long time. Looking through a century of these material, materials and thousands and thousands of petitions took quite a long time. Um, and I like to tell people, um, although my, my pictures were messed up a little bit, um, I started this research years and years ago when my uh, son was two years old and I didn't want to be away from him for the multiple weeks and months that it would take to do this kind of research. Um, and I'm from the New York area, so I brought him with me. Um, but the difference in the pictures can show you that um, <laughs> it took a long time. A, a daughter came around. She came to the further research as well. So this is the product of, of a lot of time, a lot of research. Um, uh, and there were some practical decisions made. But there were also good reasons to be looking at New York as a city with that had so many Jews in it, it's actually fairly striking that so many people would feel uncomfortable enough with their names that they felt the need to change them. And so even though there were there were some practical reasons I chose to, to research New York, I think it also really tells us a lot about both upward mobility and anti-Semitism. Um, I wanna, before I start to give my talk, I also would like to just briefly um, note that I'm looking at official legal name changing, kind of formal name changing um, that you would do in court. Um, and that's a voluntary activity that is very, very different from a lot of people's understandings of name changing. Many individuals believe that their families' names were changed at Ellis Island when their ancestors entered the country. Um, so most historians um, and immigration historians that this kind of mass involuntary name changing at Ellis Island simply did not take place. Um, this picture actually is kind of an interesting place to kind of start off and look. Um, if you look, and I'll, I'll try and bring my cursor, I don't know if you can see that, but if you look, um, people are being called up to, to the officials. And if you notice, they have these very large books there. Those are the ship manifests. If you're here and you've ever done any genealogical research, um, you will probably know what those manifests look like. They will look like this. I mean, this comes from... Um, 
this comes from microfilm, but it's it's available at ancestry.com. It's something that you know a lot of genealogists look at. This is the page that those officials are looking at. You can see it's all written in the same hand. It's these are the ship manifests that were produced before immigrants actually arrived at Ellis Island, right? Um, and you can see little check marks. If you look very closely, you can see check marks next to a lot of things. Um, Officials are asking questions. They have translators to, to translate the answers um, and they are simply checking people off. They are not asking questions like, what is your name? Moreover, immigrants did not leave Ellis Island with any official with any official documentation of any kind that would bound, that would bind them to a new name. American law gave no power to inspectors to determine individuals' names. Um, and, and I'll note that my name change petitions are filled with non-immigrants, with native born Americans. Um, uh, it is certainly possible that a few rogue inspectors recommended to immigrants that they change their names um, or that they even wrote a different name on the immigrants' tags when they were detained at Ellis Island and that immigrants maybe misunderstood these activities as permanent acts of the U.S. government. Um, but there's really little to no evidence that there was mass, systematic, involuntary name changing at Ellis Island. Um, and instead, there is actually much evidence of voluntary name changing in court petitions and also in natural naturalization petitions. And that's probably where most immigrants change their names. Um, so I'm going to talk more about the voluntary official name changing in this paper, which was coincidentally done primarily by native born um, Americans. Um, uh, and I, I'm going to talk mostly about these court petitions here. Um, if you want to talk more about this in the q and I'm, I'm certainly happy to do that. I know that it's hard to be talking about something that goes against sometimes people's family histories. And I understand that. So if that's, you know, I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, so I'm going to offer you here four arguments tonight. Um, uh, so um, one argument is that during the years between World War I and World War II, New Yorkers began to file name change petitions um, in numbers that were double, triple, and quadruple those before the wars. Um, it's really, really striking. Um, these years, really between 1917, 1945, 1946, the years I'm going to talk about, are really um, just the name changing just shoots up dramatically. Um, uh, I'm also going to offer the argument that Jews were overwhelmingly and disproportionately represented in these petitions. So New Yorkers, and broadly, I looked not just at Jewish petitions, I looked at petitions from all different groups, right? But Jews are overwhelmingly disproportionately represented in those petitions. So uh, the question is why? And I'm going to argue for you that in part, Jews upward mobility helps to explain this phenomenon. Um, but I'm gonna also argue also that anti-Semitism further helps to argue this. Um, and I have this picture, uh, which maybe I should have held up earlier on, um, that sort of shows both this upward mobility, it shows Jews moving into kind of white collar secretarial work that pays better, is a little bit easier than factory work. Um, and th those are the kinds of jobs that Jewish women in particular are really looking for um, and helps to explain um, some, of, some of the reasons that Jews change their names. Um, Jewish women are also being kept out of these jobs in large numbers. Um, and that that's kind of the dynamic that I'm going to be speaking for. So let me start with the first point. So why does why do the numbers of name change petitions rise exponentially um, in the years really during and between the wars, 1917 to 1945, 46? Um, oh dear. So I'll go back to this for a second. So during immigrant generation, during sort of the early years when immigrants came to the United States, they actually frequently did change their names, but they did so quickly and unofficially. Um, if you read immigrant memoirs, they're filled with like snap, you know, people in their apartments or, you know, in city streets, in their sweatshop, you know, they're sitting around talking to people and, you know, Jewish immigrants who've already been here for a couple of years say, ah, oh, change your name. That's no good. You know, you don't want to, you don't want people to be pestering you. That's a greenhorn name. Take this name. And they do. They take on new names. They can do so unofficially. Um, American government allows them to do that. You can change your name now, actually, unofficially, just like that. And if you call yourself that persistently, that can be your name. 
Um, uh, as a growing government bureaucracy in the 20th century, however, began to track individuals who needed to pay taxes, um, who needed to serve in the military, receive welfare benefits, um, names came to take on much more social, political, and economic significance. Ordinary individuals increasingly found it necessary or desirable to change their names officially in order to receive benefits like welfare benefits um, and to avoid penalties. Um, so the years between 1917 and 1945, an era of two world wars, depression, and the growth of the welfare state witnessed a huge boom in name changing. Um, and it's during those years that Jews change their names, right? So everybody's changing their names. Lots and lots of people are changing their names because the government is making it attractive to do so. And Jews are among those people. However, Jews are also disproportionate in filing these petitions. And I have to say, I didn't expect that. I mean, I am a Jewish historian, but I didn't necessarily expect that the names that, that I would find so many Jewish names. I found pages and pages of like Cohen's and, you know, um, Greenberg's, I mean, truly pages of them. Um, between, and I'll give you some data to sort of give you some sense of this, between 1917 and 1945, um, Jews were, far disproportionate to their number in the city. Um, during those years, the numbers of Jewish petitioners was roughly about 50% of the entire name change population. Um, but the Jewish population in New York City was at its highest around 25, 30%. Um, and if you're accounting for the fact that petitions I looked at were from Manhattan, they were not from the outer boroughs, they were mostly just from Manhattan, the disparity is even greater because the Jewish population of Manhattan hovered around 14 to 17% um, in the middle of the 20th century. Um, so Jews are well, they're at least double their, their representation in the city and they're, they're quite honestly like three to four times more than what they actually are in the city. Um, and moreover, no other ethnic group came close to Jews numbers in abandoning their ethnic names. Um, so like in 1942, the total number of petitions submitted by people with Slavic, German, Italian, and Greek surnames. So all of those together were half of the Jewish petitioners um, who were looking to erase their ethnic names. Um, and those are the next highest, right? There's no, there's no other group, right? It's just, it's just the Jews, right? In terms of, of making these kinds of petitions that are erasing ethnic names. So why is this? So this gets us to kind of this fourth arguments, which as I kind of suggested are gonna be kind of connected together. Um, so on the one hand, the presence of so many Jews reflects upward mobility. As, as I've already explained, didn't actually need to file a petition to change your name. Lots of people were doing so unofficially and, and, and cheaply. So the decision to file an official petition signals concern that somebody is gonna be looking at your name and wondering why it's different. Why do you have this, this changed name? Why is somebody is gonna be looking at your name? Um, and at this time in history, the people who are having their name looked at on a job application, on an application to go to college, um, that is primarily middle class people who have to write their names down in order to get jobs. If you were a working class person and looking for a job, say, in domestic service or loading cargo, for example, um, those kinds of jobs or, or a union job, for example, those kinds of jobs you'd get through word of mouth, right? You get it through, you know, a brother who had a job in the union, or you might get it through an inspection of your body. Right, like so, people who are looking for jobs as longshoremen, women who are looking for jobs as domestic servants, would literally stand on corners um, and and be inspected by potential employers and be selected for the look of their body. They did not fill out application forms at this time. Um, it was white collar workers who needed to present their names. The businessmen to attract customers, um, a student's need to get into professional school or college, a secretary's need to impress a potential employer. Jews were unusual among recent immigrants, um, re recent immigrant groups, um, having moved in large numbers from blue collar to white collar work by the time of the depression. They are the most recent kind of immigrant ethnic group um, that is most concerned about their name's appearance on paper. Um, so that gives you a sense that 
you know, Jews are simply more concerned about their names because of the kinds of jobs that they're looking for. However, the fact that 50% of the name change petitioners were Jewish during these years um, also suggests that pervasive anti-Semitism was limiting Jewish opportunities for employment, and it is connected to their upward mobility. As more Jews entered white collar work, they found increasing barriers to their employment. Um, according to one 1937 report, 89% of large New York companies declared that they preferred Christians as employers. Um, employment advertisements, I can show you an image here. Employment advertisements um, uh, throughout the 1930s increasingly noted that their employers were Christian and Jackson or Christian firms. And you can see in this image, if you look through statisticians need to be Protestants. Um, Guards need to be Christian. Um, even the term, you know, bank tellers need to be Christian. Um, if you uh, if you look, the term American is also kind of a code for no Jews as well, um, or you know, sort of no no visibly ethnic people, but it's definitely a code word for you know not Jews. Um, and employers routinely use names as markers to identify and exclude Jews. So journalists in the 1930s, for example. Um, reported that employment agencies and employers regularly turned away individuals with Jewish sounding names. Um, so names are clearly, uh, Jews are being watched for, looked for, they are trying to exclude them um, and they're looking for them on applications. Um, in higher education, excuse me, in higher education, um, inspired by Harvard's public consideration of quotas for Jewish students from 1922 to 1923, colleges and universities throughout the country, especially in the Northeast, began limiting the numbers of Jews they accepted during these years. Um, and they, you know, very explicitly um, and, and very carefully actually pioneered the modern application form um, in order to be able to determine who the Jews were in order to be able to exclude them. Um, so I've, I've used here John F. Kennedy's um, application in, in, to Harvard in part because actually um, application um, uh, admissions uh, departments usually don't make these materials public. Um, you can't find usually the admissions uh, the application forms, um, I, I think in part because of the kind of discriminatory nature of them, it was quite clear that they were developing these forms in order to be able to discriminate. And if you look at the questions that are asked here, I'm not sure whether you can see them, hopefully you can see it on your screen. Um, you know, before this era in the 19 teens, when you, when you would apply to say Columbia or Harvard, you would get like a half page questions like, you know, where do you live? What's your name? What scores did you get on the regents exam? Great. That's it. They began to create these long, long forms with questions like um, when and where was your father born? If your father was not born in America, has he been naturalized? What's his occupation? What's your mother's maiden name in full, right? Um, these are all questions and one is, is clearly a question designed to see if you've changed your name or if someone in your family change their name, um, right? These are, and there are pages of these kinds of questions that are all designed to kind of weed out the Jews, to determine and decide who are the Jews and to limit them. Um, this looks normal to us now because it has, be, be, because it became normal, but it actually was, is, is completely an instrument of anti-Semitism as these colleges um, began to decide that they had a Jewish problem because so many Jews were attempting to use um, college as a means of a um, and petitions I saw petition after petition in the New York City civil court kind of they at these this anti-semitism in employment and education um, uh, they don't come right out and say it but they clearly for example describe troubles that they had securing work Right. So um, in 1937, Dora Sarietsky, um, who is a stenographer and a typist, um, testified that my name proved to be a great handicap in securing a position. And she actually goes for the, the, the ellipses there are to go through all the places where she tried to get a job and couldn't get a job. Um, and then she says, in order to facilitate hearing work, I assume the name Doris Watson. Um, 
Bertram Levy, um, who was the president of the Mail Shoot Corporation in 1932, um, sought to, uh, told the court that his name has been a hindrance to him in his efforts to gain an entrance to various firms and to secure business from them. Um, so he sought permission from the court to adopt an, what would he called an American name, Bertram Leslie. Um, so you can see, I mean, the, for the most part, most of these petitioners, they have Jewish sounding names clearly, particularly Levy, um, but they are not saying at all that they are experiencing Instead, what they say um, is that they can't get jobs, they can't get work, they can't get into schools, that they are telling us about the difficulties that they're having, but they're not comfortable saying that it's anti-Semitism. Um, interestingly, there are petitions who speak about anti-Semitism that are uh, written by non-Jews. So um, uh, in an engineer named Jew. Kaminsky 1932 petitioned the court to allow him to change his name to George Joseph Cayley because he said, although he was a, a Hungarian Roman Catholic, um, the employers consistently assumed that he was a Jew, making it hard for him to keep a job. While the petition has the highest of respect for people of the Jewish race, he finds that other people in the city of New York have not that respect and that a good many employers under whom he has worked have discriminated against the Jewish race. Another Roman Catholic man named Leo Goldkopf in 1937 claimed that his friends and family members had urged him to file a petition to change his name to Leo Dawson because of his difficulties finding jobs. I have had many opportunities of obtaining employment in organizations where Christians were preferred, but my name precluded favorable consideration of my application. Upon occasions, friends of mine declined to give me a written recommendation solely on the ground that my name would make it impossible to obtain the position in question. Kaminsky's and Goldkopf's petitions um, shed, a, they're ironic, but they shed a really powerful light on the anti-Semitism that shouted so many Jews' efforts to find jobs um, and integrate into the workforce and academia at this time. Um, uh, it's worth noting that anti-Semitism, that, that uh, um, a lot of the people that we talked, that I, that I read, they're using kind of like vague language, right? Employers found my name difficult to pronounce and spell and remember, even when the name is, is pronounced and spelled phonetically, you know? So like Rose Linford, Rose Lefkowitz changed her name to Rose Linford. Um, some of them called their names foreign sounding or asked for permission to use an American name, right? And this is, you know, this is something that I feel pretty strongly about. 75% of these people were born in America, right? So their names are American, right? Like that's an American, what's an American name? It's a name of someone who's an American. Um, so many of these people use these kinds of euphemisms, like um, their names are foreign or difficult to pronounce. Um, I think in fact, maybe because they were ashamed or they felt uncomfortable, people didn't talk about anti-Semitism, particularly in these kinds of um, not, not Jewish settings. Um, and it's Catholic men, right? Um, who feel more comfortable detailing the discrimination that they've, um, that they've experienced. So I think that the differences in language there are, are really interesting. Um, so this is all, um, I've mostly been talking with you about sort of um, the rise of this during the 19 teens, 1920s, 1930s, right? Um, beginning with World War I, um, where you see the numbers go up doubly. Um, World War II intensified tremendously the trend of name changing that had begun to go up during and after World War I. So you can see here's a nice bar graph um, and you can see that the numbers double in 1917, right? Um, and stay very consistently, you know, in the 200s, 300s. But then you can see with World War II, the, the dramatic skyrocketing of name changing during the war. Um, uh, name changing reached its peak um, in 1947 with 1,127 um, name change petitions submitted. Um, that is the highest in the entire century, four times the average of the previous decade. Um, so why did Jewish name changing rise so exponentially during World War II? Um, let's see. Um, so, um, uh, Sorry, I just want to make sure I'm not going over time. Um, so um, the growth of the government during World War II correlated with, um, I apologize, I'm sorry. I, I want to make sure I don't go over and I apologize, I'm getting a little bit uh, caught up. So I'm sorry about that. Um, um, 
So the growth of the government during World War II correlated with a rise in government concern over individuals' needs. Um, ordinary individuals increasingly found it necessary or desirable to change their names officially in order to apply for officer training or to find a job in the defense industry. Um, and in a lot of my petitions, you can see the impact of like the government, of the state scrutinizing individual decisions to change their names. Men and women consistently reported that they wanted to change their names officially because they had inconsistent names on a variety of official documents. Um, and they wanted court approval to kind of ease their way through the government bureaucracy and make sure there were no government questions about their identity, which could sometimes be kind of questions that they worried might be um, kind of problematic. So so, for example, um, uh, in 1942, Saul Jack Kaufman, in a petition to change his name to Jack K, wrote, in view of the fact that I intend to register on February 16th, 1942, for selective service, I do not wish there to be any confusion with respect to my identity. Um, and that was a name he'd been using for over 20 years already. Um, a good number of individuals actually reported being specifically counseled by senior military officers or by government bureaucrats to change their names officially to avoid trouble. Um, some people thought maybe that was because they were Jewish, but it was also just that they had different names. Um, and it wasn't just male soldiers. So women too, um, who were working in the defense industry re requested the same kinds of name changes. Um, um, so she asked, there we go. She says, petitioner has been known by the name proposed for the past seven years, both socially and with her employers. Petitioner is about to apply for employment by the United States government and said application has to be accompanied by a birth certificate. Um, so, and this was sort of a part of the war, part of kind of cracking down, scrutinizing, you know, identities as a part of sort of security, but it also wound up tightening things up and, and wound up sort of falling upon ordinary Jews who had been using their names to be able to get jobs. And all of a sudden they had to change their names officially in order to be able to do anything for the, for the war effort. Um, so the growth of bureaucracy um, helps to explain the increased name changes during this era. Um, but that's not the whole story. Bureaucracy is not the whole story. The large numbers of Jews applying to change their names also suggest that forces of nationalism, racism, and anti-Semitism were also at work during World War II. Um, so this might be surprising to anyone who's seen a World War II movie. Um, so uh, the U.S. government during the war, you know, put out movies like Bataan, um, you know, where they had, you know, platoons with varied ethnic backgrounds, you know, sort of an integrated troop. Um, not always true. There were not black men in, in, in white troops at this moment, but they always had, they used names to be able to show the kind of the democratic diversity and tolerance of the U.S. This was actually required by the Office of War Information and they always had a Jewish name, right? So there's a lot of kind of propaganda that even today, a lot of people believe about the war, right? That the war is, you know, kind of a place where people, you know, learn to be tolerant um, and that there was diversity in these troops and that that created kind of tolerance and showed American democracy. Um, Ironically, however, it's worth noting that there actually was diverse names also symbolized intolerance in America. Um, poems and songs and slurs that were repeated constantly in the 1940s um, in US military forces and in civilian milieus. And they all relied on Jewish names for their humor. Um, they labeled Jewish people with Jewish names as cowardly, greedy, calculating in their willingness to escape military service and sometimes their desire to control the country. So if you'd walked into a subway or you um, picked up a military newsletter, actually, um, at this time, you might have seen um, or opened up a letter from your loved one who was uh, serving overseas, you might have seen this poem, The First American, killed in Pearl Harbor, John J. Hennessy, and I apologize for the racism of the of this of this the first pilot to sink a Jap ship. Um, Colin P. Kelly is obviously from from this era. Um, first American to sink Japanese ship with a torpedo. John P. Buckley, greatest American air hero. Butch O'Hara, first American killed at Guadalcanal. John J. O'Brien, first American to get four new tires. Abraham Lipschitz. And frequently when I give this talk in person, there's always like a little bit of nervous laughter um, because it's funny, right? 
but it's funny. It's funny because it is insulting um, and and harming the Jewish name, right? Um, and and Im imputing cowardice and greed um, and profiteering to a Jew. The names in this poem, which was not really a poem, right? It's like a you know, it's an anti-Semitic slide. But the names might change, but the first names of the heroes are always Irish or German or Anglo. And the last name was always a Jew. The last person getting four new tires was always a Jew. Um, and oral histories and memoirs and literature of soldiers um, um, at, during World War II emphasized that Jewish names were used as a source of discrimination. Uh, Jewish soldiers talked about the fact that they encountered army officers who have been so ignorant as to make derisive marks about a Jewish sounding name. No matter what the name, if it smacks of Jewishness, then it's funny. Um, and Jewish petitioners talked about this um, in very veiled terms. So Solomon Goldfarb in 1942 says, I desire that any offspring of my marriage shall not labor under the handicap of going through life with a name such as Goldfarb. This is an uncomfortable, this is an unfortunate situation of the world we live in, but it is a situation not of my making, and I feel that we must face reality. Eugene Martin Greenberg asked to change his name to Grant, um, saying, while with U.S. military forces, his career will be more successful and he may ultimately secure merited advancement. Um, on a legal assumption of said proposed surname, because there was a strong belief that Jews could not advance in the military because of their Jewish names. Um, so, so I, I want to be able to conclude. I know we're getting close. I do want to kind of note that, you know, um, a lot of people sort of see World War II as having been an integrating force, a force of democracy and tolerance and diversity. Um, some historians have argued that because Jews were working together with non-Jews in troops, um, that led non-Jews to shed any kinds of prejudices and to allow them to see one another as comrades and brothers. Um, but I think that a look at name changing um, in World War II complicates this. Um, Government propaganda encouraged white soldiers to see soldiers of different backgrounds as equals. But the fact that large numbers of Jewish men and women at this time faced anti-Semitism within the military, perceived it from their officers, perceived it from the system, saw it in newsletters, um, uh, they, they saw it and some chose to escape it by changing their names and erasing their Jewish identities from public view, um, uh, which I think suggests that it was not so easy for Jewish soldiers simply to be understood as equal. In the year 1946, 40% of the people who changed their name were veterans and their wives. Um, so it's a, an extraordinary number of people who went to World War II um, and saw Jewish names being casually targeted as humorous, open to ridicule, and even subject to discrimination, um, led Jews to become very sensitive to their Jewish names and led some to hide those badges of, of Jewishness entirely. Um, so I would kind of argue that Jews integrated into white American military forces as a result of a kind of coerced conformity rather than a kind of democratic inclusion that I think we sometimes imagine and that these World War II movies kind of propose for us. So let me leave you with some conclusions so we have time to talk because I don't want to take up too much time. Um, I'd like to sort of see that name changing reflected Jewish upward mobility. I mean, there's some there's some happy news to this, right? In some ways, right? Jews are actually successful um, in white collar work, um, and they're changing their names. You know, that is reflecting that they are having some success in white collar work, and they want to go further. They have some economic success. They can spend their economic success changing their names. Um, but it also reflected rising anti-Semitism during the same era. Um, and rather than alleviating anti-Semitism in the US, as, as some people might imagine, instead World War II probably did intensify it. Um, and so that's my kids saying thank you for coming. Um, and uh, sorry for the rush at the end. I apologize for that. I just wanted to make sure we had enough time to, to answer questions. So please let me, let, me, let me know what you have to say. Thanks so much for your time and attention. Back on. Thank you so much, Kirsten, really enjoyable talk. And we have so many wonderful questions. So I'm, I, I have some questions that I want to ask you, but I think before I ask you some of my questions, 
Um, a number of people have asked, so I think we have to start with this. Uh, they, they'd like you to tell us about your last name. Some people also want to know more about your first name. One person just came out and asked, are you Jewish? Um, so maybe you could just start with, with your, your name. Sure. Um, yes, I am Jewish. Um, and um, my name for Megla, the last name for Meglish was uh, was changed. Um, we don't know when it was changed, but it when my mother finally decided to kind of put in a V and an O with an umlaut, she was able to find Vermuglish instead of Vermeglish. Um, so, uh, you know, we don't know at what point it changed. And there are some people in the family who did actually shorten it further to firm. Um, but, you know, in general, if you know anybody with the name Vermeglish, they're re related to me. There are no other Vermeglishes in the world other than my relatives. Um, so uh, it, I believe it's Yiddish. I actually don't speak Yiddish. So, but my understanding is that Vermuglish um, is money or possible money. Um, and so it, it is kind of a Jewish name. Um, my name, Kirsten, um, is a name that came because I my parents were 60s folks and they wanted me to have, I was named actually after the alcoholic in the days of wine and roses. <laughs> if you really want to know, my parents just thought it was a pretty name and they didn't want to be kind of held down to, you know, sort of organized religion. And they just gave me, they thought I needed a foreign sounding name. And so I got one. Um, so I had never thought about my name so much until I started uh, doing this work. <laughs> and I've always liked my name. It's actually, I, 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 it's a little weird to have to answer to it in public forums, but, um, but it certainly has made me think about name changing um, and decide ultimately that I, I didn't want to change my name. Um, I'm, I'm very proud of it. Um, all names have stories and because it's my name, it's now a Jewish name. I want to ask you one more question. The first question that we got, maybe three minutes after you started speaking, uh, Sue Fern wrote, my husband, Mattis Fern, was born Mattis for Megliff. I believe we are cousins. He's All right. cousins, yeah, of the late Max Fern. Why did your family not change their names? <laughs> so are, are you Sue Fern's cousin? I don't, I don't know all my cousins, but I do know, is it, are you saying Fern or Fern with an M or an N? It's, it's F, uh, with an N is in Nancy, but it's I her don't... husband. Her husband was born Mattis for Meglish. Yeah, so I didn't know anybody had changed their name to F-E-R-N with it, like as a Nancy. I knew that there were people who changed their name to Firm, F-E-R-M. And I know Mattis, absolutely. Like that, that's definitely the name in my family. So yes, we're related. Um, but I don't, I didn't know. And actually I need to talk to my mother about that because I, I didn't know somebody had changed their name to an N, uh, F-E-R-N. I knew about Firms. I knew. Again, she writes that her husband is first cousins with the late Max Firm with an M. Yes, and those that those are the folks we know that my parents are are yeah we're we're in we're in touch with that part of the family yes um, so yes there you go this is Jewish genealogy <laughs> yes, absolutely I, let me just ask you, you, have, you have really a lot of great questions so I'm going to try to get to the question as soon as I can but I, I wanted to ask you, um, you were you personally surprised by what your study revealed that is did you begin research on this book with the assumption that Jews who changed their names did so to assimilate or did you suspect that most Jews who changed their names did so in response to anti-semitism and the desire to get better jobs educational opportunities and so on i i you know what i'm embarrassed to say that i don't think i, I you know usually as an historian like you go in and you've read some of the secondary literature so you, you you know you've read what other historians have said about the subject so you come in kind of predisposed to think something say something and i have to say that i there was very little literature there was virtually nothing there was very little that any historians had written and I have to say that I, I didn't really think about it. I mean, this is kind of an embarrassing thing to admit. I thought it was just a fascinating subject and I wasn't sure what I would find. Um, I didn't think I would find so many Jews by, by no means. I thought it would be a larger process of seeing lots of different people change their names. I was actually kind of excited about that because I actually trained as an American historian, not as a Jewish historian. And I was actually looking forward to working with lots of different groups, not just Jews. I actually thought that what I would find I, I thought maybe I'd find, you know, I was pretty sure I'd find Jews, but I didn't, I actually thought it was going to be a broader study of, of immigrants changing their names. I actually did not anticipate that this would be a story. And in fact, I had to have like friends point out to me that this was such a story of anti-Semitism because it was not, I did not expect it. And I didn't expect it to be such a Jewish story. 
I really didn't. Um, so maybe that was my own foolishness, but it was also, there was not anything in the literature. And I think I went in with a lot of these stereotypes that it was, you know, that immigrants changed their names you know, to become American, right? That that's, that that was kind of the nature of what it, what name changing was. Um, yeah, yeah, that was what I went in thinking. So, and yeah, it was kind of, it was, it was definitely not what I anticipated. I did not think I was going to be writing about anti-Semitism at all. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's just interesting because as I was reading your book, I thought if you were my age, you know, I'm about 20 years older than you are, I think you would have begun assuming that it was because of anti-Semitism and, you know, because I guess I was born closer to the explosion of name changing and you were born after. Um, I, I don't know. It was just sort of when I started reading your book, I thought I could think of so many people that I know and relatives of mine and friends of my family. And it was just so common. And I am from New York. It was just so common for Jews to change their names. But all, you know, as you write in the book, to get better, and Jews were already solidly middle class or upper middle class. Mm -hmm. So I, I just, I mean, your study really is, is fascinating. You know, you write in your book, Kirsten, that um, one reason why you had to stand online at the beginning in the New York civil courts is because this material wasn't digitized. And somebody wrote in and asked whether it has since been digitized. Are the are they digitized today? I, I don't believe so. I mean, I haven't I haven't gone back and checked, but I do not think that they are. I mean, they did not have the money for it, as far as I know. Um, so I, I, you know, it was a fascinating story. I mean, I can certainly give you more stories about my experiences, which are very unusual for historians' experiences. Um, I was I was literally standing with, and it helped to shape my work. Actually, I mean, I, I was in the office every day with you know um, you know civil servants, and then people changing their names. Are you know I was standing. On online next to them. Um, they, they, um, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I the person, the, the civil servant, the, the, one of the people working at the court told me that he had tried to put in the money for a grant to try to get these materials um, digitized. I believe what's digitized now for the more recent stuff is the indexing. So if you've changed your name more recently, so when I went up through 2012, the last, I think the beginning in 2007 or 2002, um, you can see an end, you can access through it index, you know, the names that are changed, but not the petitions. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I had to use indexes. I mean, I was using indexes that were all hard copy. I don't believe any of it. I mean, this is boxes and boxes. I mean, it's like, I compare it to the room when they show, first showed it to me. I compare it to like the room in the, at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, where they go in and there's just this huge room with just boxes and boxes like stacked up to the top. That's what it was like. I mean, it was just boxes and boxes. It would be a lot of money. And I just don't think the New York City Civil Court, it's not their interest. So um, yeah, so as far as I know, no. Let me ask you one more question, then we'll open it up. I have to say, I was fascinated um, by the importance of race in your study, mm -hmm. um, especially given the fact that Jews are not a race. But you discuss in the book, um, moving even beyond the period of time that you talked about tonight, how the fact that middle and upper middle class Jews in mid-century could use name changing as a means of being accepted as whites in elite American social circles and how that really differentiates Jewish name changing from that of other racial groups. And I'm wondering if you could, I, I'm, there were a few questions that people have asked about this. Jews were not the only group of people who changed their names, but you argue in the book that in some ways Jewish name changing was, was unique. Can you talk a little more about that? Sure. Well, so it's a difference in time frame. So in the in the in the beginning, so from 19, you know, from the 1887 period through, say, the, you know, the six, I mean, Jews are really disproportionate all the way through the 60s. I mean, they are disproportionate during all that period of time. They're disproportionate to other ethnic groups changing their names, and they're also disproportionate for their existence in the city. They just are. Um, so I did look at other groups. It was primarily kind of white ethnic groups, very few people of color um, in those early years. Um, so it is just, it's, it's overwhelmingly mostly white ethnic groups. And this is, of course, Jews are not only white, right? Jews, Jews are not, you know, Jews can be lots of colors, but at this moment, they're mostly Ashkenazi, it's mostly Ashkenazic Jewish names. Um, and, you know, there are very few to no black um, name change petitioners during those early years. Um, 
so I compare in the early years, I mean, I compare Jews, for example, to like Italians. Um, so Italians are the group that's probably like has, and it switches over time, different years, different other ethnic groups kind of emerge. But, um, you know, Italians are changing their names roughly um, equivalent to their existence in the city, right? If they're about 10% of the city, they're about 10% of the petitioners. So Jews are just so far out of whack in comparison to how many of them live there. And they're far out of whack compared to all the other ethnic groups. I, the, my work though, I do go all the way to 2012. And my final chapter does look at now Jews are not at all disproportionate, right? That changes by the 1980s really. Um, and then there's a new explosion of name changing after 9-11. And, and what we do see now is that it is primarily um, working class people of color and women who are the people who are mostly changing their names. Um, and they're doing so in really, really different ways. They are mostly, yes, because of race, they are, they, they, they don't have kind of a liminal, they don't, they don't, they don't have kind of an identity that would make a name change allow them to get a better job, right? They are marked by their physical characteristics um, uh, racially as different. Um, and so a name change for them is not necessarily going to be getting them middle-class jobs. And so they're mostly changing their names for family reasons. They're changing their names because uh, a, a husband left or they're changing their name because somebody died or they're divorced or, or those kinds of things, or they're having trouble with security. Um, but they're not, they're, they're not changing their names for these kinds of upper middle-class reasons. I, I don't, I don't know. I could go on, but I don't want to, I, I don't yeah. want to take too much time, but, um, but yeah, I mean, race absolutely plays a role. The fact that Jews, Ashkenazic Jews pretty much look white means that they, they can do this, but of course their, their names are being used to turn them into a race, right? So the, the purpose of these application forms is literally to take people who sort of maybe look like they're white and be able to give them a, a marker that then makes them a different race, right? So if they then have the name Levy, they've become that race, right? Um, and and that that's kind of one of the central thing, stories, I think, of the book. Right, and that leads to the whole historical connection between name changing and passing. And, you know, if we had more time, we could talk a lot more, more about that. I, I have to say, by the time I got to that section in your book, I was really um, thinking of Philip Roth and his book, The Human Stain, which, yes. which yeah. is, about both names and passing, yeah. right? I mean, the story of a, of a light-skinned black former professor at a college who amazingly decides that he's gonna change his identity being Jewish mm -hmm. during World War II. Um, and his name, I mean, I think it's significant that his name, Coleman Silk, might be a Jewish name. It's not a, an identifiably black name, but again, the whole focus of the book is on passing. And I, I just, I know you're interested in the whole topic of passing as well. And again, a topic for another time, but let's, let's get back I'd to love it. I would love we it. We have a ton of questions here. All right, yeah. I'm going to just, um, I'm going to, let me see. Um, well, one person asked, would you say that name changing is a major obstacle when tracing one's Jewish roots? You know, so I am not a genealogist. My mother does more of the genealogy in the family. She's the one who figured out that we were from Oblish. Um, so I, I am actually, I, I know mostly from what I hear from her and other, I mean, I've given talks to lots of genealog to, uh, genealogical groups and that is my, that's my understanding, right? I mean, I know my mother worked for years and was like, ah, we can't find our family. And then, you know, she figured out this name change and was able to make a lot of connections. And I certainly do understand that that's, I mean, I do, I talk to a lot of genealogists groups and I think people are really really interested in that because it does it does pro pro produce an obstacle absolutely um yeah. I haven't experienced it personally but as I say certainly it's an issue in my family and what I hear from a lot of people yeah I I would say my sister Amy and I um have been on ancestry DNA for the last few years and it, it is really amazing how many people because because ancestry DNA have have connected us to each other, even though most of the people who've written to us are no longer Umansky. Um, that's one way to easily find people who are related to you despite their names. And when I used to have more time to do some uh, genealogical research in my family, ship's manifests are enormously helpful. Yeah. Um, because as you talked about this evening, you know, that was the name that they had when they left Europe. 
And so if you have any idea or any sort of variation on your name, it's that that stuff is digitized and yeah. it's pretty easy to find and, and census records. Um, you can find all of this free. So, all right, let's, let's, let's go on here. We hear the most, we, um, we hear the most, and a few people asked a variation of this question. We hear the most about name changing at Ellis Island. Did name changing also occur at the Canadian border for people that entered there from Europe? Well, so I would say in general that the name changing is is not at Ellis Island. Um, and so I, you know, I, I assume the Canadian border that it's also that they're using a similar process um, uh, and that they're not actually changing names. But I uh, am embarrassed to say that I did not look at Canadian name changing in, in much depth at all. I do look at a, a, um, a family that had its roots in Toronto, um, but I, I'm not, I, I apologize that I just don't know enough about Canadian um, Jewish history to be able to answer. And I, I didn't look at Canadian name changing. Um, so I apologize that I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, and, you know, I, I'll say, I don't know whether uh, people ask about other things. Uh, you know, there are comparisons for certain to other Jewish, so Israel and England, people have asked me, you know, from time to time, whether the story of American name changing is unique or how much it's similar to other places. And I would say that, um, you know, I'm always struck by sort of similarities between the US and Israel in terms of the fact that, you know, in both of them, Eastern European Jewish names were um, seen as, as very low class and things that people wanted to change and that the government in varying levels was kind of encouraging that Jews do change away from kind of Austrian names, you know, Jew, you know, Eastern European Jewish names. Um, so I think those are really interesting similarities. Um, and I do think you certainly, I mean, if you look at English Jewish history does feature a lot of name changing in this way. Um, I, I think that the United States has a lot more openness to name changing than probably anywhere else in the world. Um, the US has used name changing as kind of a way of integrating um, people and, and really encouraging it in a way that I think is, is fairly unique throughout the world. Mm -hmm. And related to that, and some people are asking variations of this question as well, um, is the fact that uh, people are asking whether the first Jewish family member to come over to America, did they first change their name and then other people change their name as well? In your book, though, you talk about how couples change their names together. Yeah, so this is really interesting. I mean, I, I didn't. I took this out of the argument, out of the paper. Frequently, this talk, I include this argument, but because we wanted to keep it shorter and have more time for conversation, I took out this argument. One of the other things that really surprised me, actually, which I, I should have, um, I realized, made clear, is that what I also what was fascinating. You know, I made this point about it being individual. You know, all these images are individuals, but actually, these petitions have two, three, four, six people on them. Um, people are changing their name together as families, um, very much so. It is a family, family process. Um, uh, and that doesn't always mean that like extended family. So it doesn't mean that like, you know, if you had your brother came in in 1892 and then you come in in 1907 and their family has changed their name, it doesn't mean that you coming in are necessarily going to take that new name. As you can see, I'm from English and there's firms, right? So not every branch of the family necessarily changes, but within immediate families and even like brothers, adult brothers and siblings, you see them changing their names together a lot. And I think in part that is because of issues of kind of this is about middle class mobility and there's a certain shame to having a different name. Right. There's suspicion and questions. And some of the petitions talk about that, that there's embarrassment and suspicion about like, why, how can you be a family member if you have a different name? And so I think that there was a certain desire for as many family members as you knew that were how people might find you. Right. That you all kind of changed your name together so that you could kind of preserve the veneer of, of this kind of middle class respectability with this new name. Right. So therefore, you, are you saying that you see this more in Jewish name changing than in name changing among other ethnic groups? No. So no. So it's also cheaper to change your name as a family. So Italians and Greeks and Slavs, and there's very few Greeks, but Italians and Slavs, they change their names in, as in family units too. They just don't do so in as large numbers. They just, they're not doing, they're doing it representative to their 
population. But no, but but the, because our image of name changing is so individual, I think it is important to sort of note that it really wasn't an individual decision. It was a family decision, like by this moment, and especially for Jews, I think because they are all facing anti-Semitism, right? So a wife might be working as a, a stenographer, or they might be worrying about their kids who they want to get into a school, right? So they're all going to change their family and that their name in that way, which I think is going to be kind of more of a propulsion for more of the families to change their names than you might have for an Italian family, for example, where women are not working, right? Um, and they may not be getting middle-class jobs where they're necessarily concerned that their son or their daughter can't get in, you know, can't get employed by you know, this employer or can't get into the school, right? It's not, it's not forming that family's concern in the same way. So in other words, you paid per, per petition? Yep. Okay. Not yep. by how many people were on the petition. Right. So I think probably, right, exactly. So I found petitions, most of the petitions, I don't know if I have the numbers at my fingertips, but most of the petitions were um, multi, had, had more than one person on the petition. Um, there, there were, you know, you at least had a couple. Um, and brothers changed together, um, you know, entire family units. I mean, I, I think the largest I found was eight or nine, one, you know, because you'd have, you know, the parents and then you'd have adult siblings and then you'd have the adult siblings, um, spouses, you know, like you just had large numbers of people on, on these petitions, some of them, and then some of them would be, you know, one, but the majority of them had at least two or three. I mean, it was, it was very much a family activity. One person asked, would an employee be fired? If the employer found out post hire that the employee was Jewish but used a legally anglicized name on the paperwork, I, I, my, my sources just don't give me information about that. I don't have any information about that. I do. So I did have a couple of sources that don't really speak to the, and that's an interesting question. Nobody's, I don't think anybody's asked me that. Um, I do have sources of people saying that they changed their names. There are not very many people who wanted to change their names back. But I do have a couple of petitions from people who wanted to change their names back. And they do describe, um, uh, you know, that, you know, if they're dealing with other Jews, the Jews made fun of them or didn't want to hire them or, you know, so nobody got fired. But um, and, and it's not like sort of like non-Jews looking down and being like, oh, you, you, you defrauded me or anything like that. I just haven't heard anything like that. But I did find that with people changing their names back, that once they had changed their names, that Jewish employers or Jewish clients um, were not happy with that. Um, they did not like that name change. So well, they didn't feel defrauded. They just were like, you're, you're betraying our community. You know, we don't, you know, they would make fun of them. Um, one person changed his name back because he wanted to marry an Orthodox Jewish woman and her family wouldn't let the marriage take place because he had changed his name. What, what decade was that in? Uh, 30s, 40s. I don't, all of these are from the, early in the century. Yeah. They're all they're all from the 30s and 40s. Yeah. I mean, in you know, the stuff I'm talking about and, and kind of the bulk of it is, right. is at this moment. Right. Did, did someone is asking, did the court ever refuse petitioners request to change names? So I don't have evidence of that from the petitions, but there are there are court orders that I have been able to find through some other like old articles. Um, so there were very few. Um, I, I actually I took it out of the story, which is kind of surprising. I sometimes have it here. Um, there are a few great examples of Jewish judges who turned back uh, Jewish petitions um, with very funny language. I, I don't know why I took, I, I used to have it. I took it out of this one probably for time issues uh, where they would, you know, there was an example of a judge Levy turning down, a, uh, excuse me, he, he accepted the request of someone named Levy trying to change his name to something else. But he said, you know, my success proves you could be successful. You know, we, you, let, let this man change his name so his people can be done with him, you know, and we want no more of him. You know, it was one of those kind of things. So, it, you know, they were, um, there, there, there were a few of those. And then most concerning, and um, I, did, I, I didn't, I found this written about in a secondary source, um, in, a, in a historical text, um, there was one judge during World War II who turned down a number of um, name changes saying that the government has, in a time of war, the government has an interest in knowing the ethnic or the, the national background of, of its citizens. Um, that is, that's it. That's all I've got. In general, everything I see is that thousands of people, all of my things, they're almost all accepted. So I think there's a few instances of judges kind of 
being either upset or, or anti-Semitic. Um, but in ge the general thrust is that this was a welcome move. This was not something that the government was looking to discourage. In fact, it encouraged it. Hmm. Well, someone else asks, have you found any evidence that the Shoah had any influence on the high rate of Jewish name changes? It's a good question. Um, no, I mean, not, not in general. Um, I think that you could, you can read into some of the language. Um, I think in the 30s and 40s, you can see some of the language, like I read of Sol Solomon Goldfarb saying, you know, my name is a, is an impediment. Uh, I can't remember um, a handicap, you know, using terms like this that I think maybe sort of reflect a certain fear of anti-Semitism um, and a sense of kind of the growing conflict. Um, there's one, there's a few petitions that are very poignant, but they, they, none, nothing, nothing is, um, nothing is clear, is clearly spoken. And then after the war, I do have a few examples of some survivors changing their names. My sense is that because you could also change your name with naturalization petitions, that probably a lot more survivors, if they did change their names, changed their names using naturalization petitions than they did with my petitions. But I did find a few, actually the example that I just gave you of um, people changing their name and then changing them back. One of them was a survivor of the show, actually, who um, I, I think they were refugees before the war, actually. Um, but I think they changed their name after the war. They, they came to the US like in the late 30s and they thought they needed to change their names to get jobs. But then they knew all they had all these Jewish networks and survivor networks and people who kind of looked down on them. And they said that people who'd been clients of theirs before the war, you know, before this now didn't want to work with them because they changed their names. So they changed their names back. So that was someone who was a refugee. Um, um, so there, there's some, um, but not as much as I would have thought. And you heard from my, um, you heard from my my biography that my last book was on Holocaust memory. So I think I might have maybe if I I understand your question, and I think I might have imagined that there would have been more. It doesn't it doesn't come through clearly. It comes through in in in, in shadows and kind of vague hints. I think. Huh. Um, one question from Neil Ginsburg: During and after World War II, were there many? Were there many examples of people with Jewish names who were promoted within the military or flourished in the US after the war? Um, right after the war, or um, I guess I can't. It, so I'll just have to. I'll just have to run. I'll run with it. I'll. I'll, I'll kind of guess what you're asking, Neil Ginsburg. I'm sorry. Um, I don't. You know, that's a really interesting question that no one has asked me. I did not. I. I did not. Um, I did not follow that line of question. Like I didn't, I didn't think to like do that kind of research. Um, you know, I, I imagine there are ways that you could probably do it. I'm not an economist. I'm not generally a big numbers person. It was actually, this was a major switch for me to kind of do the, cause I did a lot of um, kind of numeric work with this that I don't usually do. I'm sure there are ways of kind of tracking that if you, if you had um, kind of, you know, particular categories you were looking in, I didn't do that kind of looking. My sense is that, um, you know, people with those kinds of names probably didn't become as successful until the 60s, um, where, when there are still disproportionate name changes among Jews, but I think there, there's more comfort with those kind of Jewish sounding names as there's kind of a cultural change by the 1960s. But I didn't look at this systematically, so I can't answer you um, as well as I could. But it's an interesting, um, there's probably ways you could, you could track that. That's interesting. Well, here's a question from an anonymous attendee that really isn't directly related to your research, but I'm going to ask you anyway. She writes, or he writes, um, I've been called too pushy, being too Jewish, that I wear my Jewishness on my sleeve, told to hide my Jewishness in order to protect my safety in my life. Do you have a strategy of how to achieve inclusion and being warmly welcomed rather than ignored, overlooked, or eradicated and left out? Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, don't ask historians for strategies. We can only tell you about what happened in the past, not what you should do in the future. Um, I mean, I, I don't know whether I don't know whether this question is kind of asking whether this is a problematic strategy that I'm describing, right? That I, I, that's the sense that I'm gonna take this question and that that you know, I'm describing this as a strategy that people used when they were faced with great pressure, right? Um, a lot, a lot of pressure economically, um, as well as socially and, and personally, right? Um, and I think what this, the way I'm gonna read this question is that you're asking me whether this is a good strategy and whether maybe there's problems with the strategy. And I think that, and, and whether maybe, you know, 
whether maybe now we might encourage people to develop some other kind of strategy that would not involve erasing a, a family name, erasing a connection to your, your community and your, um, and I, yeah, I mean, I think there were problems with the strategy. I didn't, you know, the middle part of my book, which I didn't wind up talking about, Nell and I talked about this right before the, the talk, the middle part of my book talks about a lot of unease within the Jewish community about this strategy um, after the war. It doesn't really emerge before the war. And I think it doesn't emerge before the war because people are so overwhelmed by anti-Semitism and they're so scared that they, you know, they don't know how to react, but there's not a lot of attacks on people who change their names before the war. Um, they see it as this, assimilation, and people are facing anti-Semitism, they, they don't do very much. After the war in the 40s and 50s, there is much more kind of, um, kind of um, internal debates within the Jewish community and a lot more attacks on people who've changed their names as betraying the community, uh, you know, self-hating Jews being people who are self-hating Jews. And I, I, don't, I don't like that necessarily. Like I, I, don't, I don't like the idea of attacking people who felt themselves under stress and, you know, chose, chose you know, the, the best they could do, you know? So I don't necessarily like that, but people who changed their names, like they did face, like they kept secrets from their children. Their children were pained, you know, grandchildren were pained, you know, decades later to learn of this. Um, I think that, you know, just anytime you need to cut off a piece of yourself to one portion of the world, no, I don't think that's, that, that's not a strategy I would want. I don't know that I can say what strategy. I mean, I think being able to keep the name Kirsten from English or whatever is your name is, is clearly a better strategy, um, you know, to be able to sort of fight for, for diversity and inclusion in a way that I hope that we try to now in university campuses and, you know, I, I think is much better. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not, I would not promote this as a good strategy. Um, you know, I'm more describing it and the context, the, 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 the situation where people felt themselves in so we don't attack them, right? Or ignore them, but sort of recognize what they were facing and acknowledge that this is what they were facing and that this was the strategy that worked at the time. Mm. Uh, uh, Gary Bykoff writes, uh, my close friend in Jackson Heights was Jackie from English. <laughs> My entire family is here. I know. Yeah, yeah. And we have a lot more questions that are here that we won't get to. But if I find any others that, oh, wait. I, know, right no, Jackie, I love Jackie. I, I, I haven't seen him in ages. And he's he. I, you I, know I, him? His name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jackie from English. I know. But he changed his name to Fern, though. Oh, um, and, and Gary asked, what, ha what happened to Jackie? I haven't talked to them. I haven't talked to him in ages. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, uh, it's clear my mother's not on this call. She would be. She would be laughing right now. Um, I haven't talked to Jackie in a long time, but I was. We were close when we were young. Um, he's older than I am, but we. You know, I definitely saw him at family stuff, and I love to hang out with him. So, oh, I haven't thought about Jackie in a while. <laughs> well, I. You know, th th this is the advantage of having an unusual name. I, I receive multiple emails every month from people who ask me if I'm related to a certain Umansky and, you know, whereas if we have more usual names or, you know, we, we probably wouldn't get as many. We wouldn't get, no, right, exactly. Are you, do you know that, Cohen? No. <laughs> um, let me see if we have time, maybe for one more, we really have to go. So um, if this, you really, we have so many, we have, we had almost 70 questions uh, for this talk, um, but I have to say, a few people have written and asked me, um, they said, if I heard you correctly, one person says, you said Jews are not a race. Jews are not a race. Jews are, there are, there are white Jews, there are black Jews, there are Asian Jews. Jews are not a race. In the late 19th century, um, right-wing politicians and fascists labeled Jews a race, but uh, Jews are, are not a race. And I, they are you know, people, we're an ethnic group, you know, for many Jews, Jews are also a nation, but Jews are not a race. Person, you have anything you want to say on that? Well, I would say, you know, race is always a construction, right? Race doesn't right. have any real meaning, right? So none of it is real, right? But the effects are real. And, you know, Jews have obviously been treated as a race since the 19th century. And, and that has real consequences and real impact. So that kind of racial thinking from others winds up shaping the group that is treated. And so that historical legacy, I think, you know, so it's, it's, it's all a construction. None of it is real. Right. But then the effects of it have real impact on people's lives is, is what I would say. Um, Absolutely. And that's where Whoopi Goldberg went wrong. Exactly. I mean, Whoopi Goldberg. Right. I mean, she was wrong. Jews 
have been perceived as race. Exactly. And, exactly. and you know, in World War II, during the holiday, I mean, Jews were put to death, not because of who they were, but because of who their grandparents were. Mm -hmm. And it really had nothing to do with their religious identity, it really did have to do with some fantasized racial identification of, of Jews. Yeah. Um, well, we're unfortunately out of time. There's so much more that I could ask you and there's so much more we could discuss. I really want to thank you so much, Kristen, for being with us this evening. I want to thank everyone in the audience uh, who, who is here as well in our virtual audience. Uh, just to give a plug for the next Bennett Center lecture, which uh, we have a few weeks, I think, until it, uh, we get to this Monday, March 7th, which I guess I think it's in a week and a half from now. I'm not really sure. Uh, but we have the annual Adolf and Ruth Schirmacher lecture in Judaic studies. Our speaker this year is uh, Carol Myers, who is the Mary Grace Wilson Professor Emerita of Religious Studies at Duke University. Uh, Dr. Myers is a biblical scholar, a field archaeologist, and author of Discovering Eve, Ancient Israelite Women in Context. And she's giving a talk uh, called The Ancient Gender Gap, the Bible, archaeology, and Israelite women. Uh, I know Dr. Meyer, um, Dr. Myers, it's going to be a fascinating talk. And if you're interested in attending this talk, you just have to register at fairfield.edu backslash Bennett programs. Kristen from English, thank you so much. I look forward to the time when we can see one another in person. That's Again, good. everyone, thanks for being with us and um, stay safe. Yeah, and thank you all so much. It was just wonderful. And um, if you have any follow-up questions, you can feel free to look for my email online and I'm happy to answer any questions. So great. great. Bye, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you to everyone. Have a good night. Thanks, bye. Bye.